you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Before we get started this time, we want to say thank you to some people. Yeah, the Swedish people. We'd like to thank the whole country of Sweden for their hospitality during the Sona Sweden conference. Specifically, the organizer of the course, who put on maybe the best ultrasound course I've ever been to. Definitely the best non-castle based. Seriously, Chris, Martin, Jesper, you guys did an amazing job. Chris's mustache, Martin's mustache, the whole crew was amazing. Wonderful people in a world-class conference. And the participants were amazing. Maybe it was the robes, maybe it was the hot baths, or even the massages at every break, but the participants, those guys were spectacular. Ooh, I wasn't a huge fan of the fish eating the dead skin up our feet, but I was a fan of the collaboration. To get serious for a minute, I think this course was a model for collaboration that we should all strive for with point of care ultrasound. Yeah, we taught alongside internists, cardiologists, radiologists, pediatricians. It wasn't overwhelmingly emergency medicine like it is in the States. It was just a bunch of doctors who want to take better care of their patients. Turns out no one owns the probe. And no one owns sound waves. And no one owns the heart, gallbladder, or aorta. Sweden, thanks for showing us exactly what that kind of collaboration looks like. Oh yeah, if, if you want to see what really went down, what it disintegrated to, then stay tuned for bonus footage at the end. Don't worry, Sweden attendees. Only incriminating footage of Mike and I in that one. We know how frustrating it can be to not really understand tissue harmonic imaging, so we're going to help you with that. Also, it's time for some homework. You've been listening to this physics stuff all month long, so we're going to test you. Stone will give you some homework to do to test your skills and help you bring some of this stuff home. Follow along with him when you get to that part and get familiar with your buttons. I also want to address something real quick before we start, though. These podcasts from the Ultrasound Leadership Academy are a little different than our normal podcasts. We kind of roll through the information, not a lot of jokes. And that's because we tend to be pretty immature and have a hard time being serious. So we end up joking around, having a lot of fun during our hangouts with our fellows. So the content we deliver, we try to take pretty serious and get down to business. We've got so much to cover during the 12 months that we try not to take up too much time with the jokes. We hope you don't mind the straight business approach here. All right, time to learn. Now, I know everybody was excited to get done with physics in the first month, but there's a few things left uncovered that we really should be getting back around to at this point. And the good news is that, again, we're going to try our best to keep it clinical and make it something that's relevant to your daily practice and isn't just learning things for the sake of learning them so you can say that you know how to explain the Nyquist limit or you know how to explain what aliasing really is on a fundamental physics level. Um, but if you're going to understand what's going on in this image, you need to understand a little bit about Doppler shifts and physics. So what we're going to do is we'll talk first about tissue harmonic imaging, which is a nice way to ease into some of the more advanced concepts, and then we'll spend the rest of this brief talk talking about Doppler physics because they're central to cardiac and vascular imaging. And we'll follow it up with a quick demonstration and with some homework for you for you to work on with your own ultrasound system. So the first thing we'll talk about is tissue harmonic imaging. And tissue harmonic imaging is a way of reducing artifact and cleaning up your image, particularly when you're dealing with fluid-filled structures like the heart and the gallbladder. And its premise is that there is a fundamental frequency that is transmitted from the ultrasound crystal into tissue. And in most cases, that's the fundamental frequency that you're used to discussing when you discuss the frequency range of an ultrasound transducer. So for example, this is a phased array transducer. It'll typically have a frequency somewhere in the range of 5 to 1 megahertz or a million hertz. And that is the fundamental frequency. Let's say that it's operating at 2 megahertz for the sake of argument. So in this case, you're pulsing a signal at 2 megahertz frequency into tissue. And f harmonic frequencies arise at 4 megahertz, at 8 megahertz, and so on, at multiples of the original fundamental frequency. And the way to think about this is if you strike a tuning fork and listen, it rings at that frequency, but you hear the higher fundamental, uh, excuse me, harmonic frequencies on top of that. And um, why does this happen? Well, it happens because the ultrasound beam is really strong, and there's a bunch of different superficial anatomic layers that distort the sound beam and create these fundamental frequencies. So what if you could get rid of that distortion 
and instead listen only to the harmonic frequencies that are generated deeper in tissue and don't get distorted as they pass through this superficial tissue. And that's the, the premise of tissue harmonic imaging, is that the machine will pulse at the fundamental frequency, which in this case is 2 megahertz, and it will listen for the harmonic frequencies. So it, let's say it'll listen for 4 megahertz. The 4 megahertz signal is created in tissue by the sound wave from the fundamental frequency penetrating into tissue. So it travels a shorter distance. It's less artifactually altered by the tissue um, transit time and by the different acoustic impedances of the tissue it'll meet along the way. So the goal of harmonic imaging, it's basically a high-tech way of reducing noise content. And it dis it's basically will selectively distinguish real reflections from noise and in general that's referred to as reducing the signals to noise ratio so that's uh, something that's favorable in ultrasound imaging and that's what tissue harmonics do now knowing all of that doesn't help you to know what it'll do on your ultrasound system. On your ultrasound system, you'll press a button called Tissue Harmonic Imaging, or THI, and pressing that button will reduce some of this artifactual noise. And on the left image here, we have a long view of the gallbladder, and we've got the gallbladder neck there up towards fundus, neck of the gallbladder up towards fundus. There happens to be a gallstone with shadowing here. And, on the, and there's no tissue harmonic imaging on this image. On the right imaging, we do have tissue harmonic imaging, and it is the same patient, although you don't see the gallstone in this plane, they're just fanning through the gallbladder and didn't happen to catch it in this cut. But what you'll see right away is the bile in the gallbladder is blacker on this side than it is here. It's lost some of that speckle artifact. And you're also able to see the valves of Heister down here by the cystic duct and the neck of the gallbladder, which you can vaguely make out over here in the image without THI turned on. But there's a nice difference in clarity between the two. So why not keep it on for everything? Well, it can falsely exaggerate the width of certain structures deep to the uh, fluid-filled areas. So even in this case, the gallbladder wall looks thicker here than it does here. Here. It's thick in both cases, but it looks like it's probably thicker on the right side, and that may or may not be artifactual. So it's not something to keep on all the time for all of your imaging, but it is something that's worthwhile making sure is on for cardiac imaging, and most of the cardiac presets will default to tissue harmonics, and it's definitely worth having on for biliary imaging. So tissue harmonics, just another function on the machine, didn't get covered in the introductory lecture because it's a little bit too cerebral to get into the, the um, physics behind it right off the bat. That, but that's tissue harmonics. So um, really no other advanced B-mode physics that I think are worth covering. So this is your physics homework assignment, and the only thing I can say is that it's going to be way more fun than any physics homework assignment you've ever had. This is something I call the carotid challenge, and the idea is that you are going to obtain a view of your carotid artery with your non-dominant hand or your dominant hand holding the transducer, and then you're going to make your way through all of the changes on the ultrasound system that will adjust the color and the Doppler settings. Do this for 10 minutes and you will be able to optimize a color and Doppler image on anything. And I think it's really worthwhile to work your way through this exercise. So I'm going to show you an example of me going through it just to give you the tools so you can go ahead and replicate this and get this level of familiarity. So this is a B-mode image that I have obtained on my carotid artery. And um, we've got the walls of the carotid right here. And this is the lumen in there. Okay, and this is a longitudinal image. You can do it in transverse or in longe or in both, and I think it'll help you um, get even more familiar. One of the things you're going to want to do is make sure that your resolution is um, as high as possible. So the carotid artery typically going to be just a couple of centimeters underneath the skin. You want to have the broadband transducer. In this case, it's a 10.5 megahertz transducer. I want it operating closer to 10 megahertz. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to resolution, which it is here. And then you want to make sure that if you have a dynamic range setting on your ultrasound system or a contrast setting, you want to decrease the dynamic range or increase the contrast, which just gives you more black and white and less gray. 
the advantage to more black and white and less gray is when you're looking at vascular structures because they're filled with black, they're going to sort of pop out better from the surrounding tissue. So I would do that uh, adjustment as well. Other than that, I don't think I adjust any of the B-mode stuff. And I'll just talk through the rest of it as it goes so I don't interrupt the video. So here we go. We're going to start playing. And I'm obtaining a good longitudinal view of the carotid. Adjusting gain and depth. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, and I'm just playing with the dynamic range to remind me to tell you guys about it. So you want to make sure resolution and a low dynamic range. You want to decrease the overall gain when you're doing uh, Doppler or color imaging on your B-mode image because you really don't want the machine to have to process a lot in terms of the image. So here I'm decreasing the overall gain on the B-mode image. I can still see what I need to. There is the color button pressed and by changing the angle on the color button, I'm able to get out of that both directional flow that I was seeing and see flow in just a single direction. And this is not a bad Doppler setting that I have right here. What I'm going to do is try and mess it up. So here I've turned the color gain all the way up and now we're seeing speckly flow outside of the vessel. I've now turned it all the way down and there's no flow in the vessel. So that's color gain. Now, you want it to be at a point where it fills the structure, but it's not outside of the structure. And now I'm changing the pulse repetition frequency or the scale, which you're seeing on the top left. That 31 just went to 50. So I'm increasing the scale, coming back to 31. At 31, at a mid-range frequency, at a mid-range scale, I'm able to see diastolic flow and systolic. Here in high range, I just see systolic. There's mid-range with some diastolic as well. And I like the look of that, so I'm going to keep it there. Now we're going to go ahead into pulse wave Doppler and we're going to do some uh, triplex imaging. So here I've increased the size of the sample volume. I'm sampling the entire carotid and you're seeing aliasing. So first thing I'm going to do is, is move the baseline to try and fit everything on there. Then I'm going to increase the scale. And again, increasing the scale has gotten it to the point where our flow is fitting nicely on the screen, even in pulse wave. There's no need to have such a big sample volume, so I'm just showing you that that is something you can change. I'll typically keep the sample volume pretty tight for peripheral vascular imaging at least. And I don't like the fact that it's all negative Doppler shift here. It's really not important to me, so I'm going to press the invert button in the center there and flip it right side up. It just seems more natural for me to be looking at it that way. And... <clears throat> Here I'm just looking at the velocities and that's a nice scale to be able to see the velocities well. You'll see that if I take the angle correction off, I still see flow, but if we measure the flow that's visible using pulse wave Doppler with the angle correction off here, we're going to measure peaks, our peak uh, systolic velocity at about 46 centimeters per second there, so 46. And then we're going to go into pulse wave and we're going to do angle correction there. Um, and we're going to get the angle to be parallel to the flow as close as we can. We only have a few options on the sonosite here. Um, and here we're getting, we haven't changed anything else, but instead of 46 centimeters per second, we're getting 91.5 centimeters per second. So um, a basic principle of Doppler imaging is you can't make the Doppler shift be faster than it is. So if you get two velocities and one's faster than the other, go with the faster one. So that's a more accurate measure, and that's because the angle of incination is closer to zero degrees because of that angle correction. So getting back to the Doppler shift equation. Um, also, subtle manipulations of the actual transducer, angling it up and down, um, you know, pressing on the distal or the proximal end of the transducer to get a more parallel view of the, um, of the vessel of interest will change your velocities. And you're seeing here that some of them are going to be faster than others because of that same um, transducer manipulation. So lots of things that you can do with the transducer will subtly affect these velocities. Um, if you start to alias like you are there on the, on the bottom right, you're seeing those. And now throughout the tracing, you're seeing those peaks. You can either increase your scale like I just did, or you could move your baseline. Either one would be acceptable. So I want you to go ahead and go to your ultrasound system, get a view of your carotid artery, and turn the gain, once you have color on, turn the gain all the way up and turn the scale all the way down. And then from there, try and recreate a good color flow image 
Try and get all of your settings together to the point where you feel like you're not aliasing in Doppler, your color flow is nice and clean, it's a single color within the vessel, and you feel like you're getting accurate measurements. And I think really messing around with this with your own controls in a stress-free environment where it's just you and the machine will let you gain the familiarity that you need to get good at Doppler settings. And once you do, there's a lot you can accomplish, but it's definitely a little intimidating at first, and I think spending 5-10 minutes with the machine, knowing that you're going to be adjusting the size of the sample, you're going to be adjusting the frequency of the system, you're going to turn the overall B mode down a little bit, the overall brightness mode gain down a little bit, you'll mess with the color gain and with your scale or your pulse repetition frequency, you can move the baseline, you can invert, and just getting comfortable with these techniques will let you get a lot more um, capable when it comes to really moving forward and doing some good vascular and cardiac imaging. All right, enjoy the carotid challenge. Let me know how it goes. There you go, tissue harmonic imaging and some serious out there physics from Dr. Stone. Will this deep dive into physics ultrasound ever end, you say? Well, maybe not. Maybe we'll just keep replaying these clips over and over and over and over. It'll be like Groundhog Day where all the jokes never change and everyone says the same thing every time you listen to it. Say, did I ever tell you about how silly Dawson's voice is? I mean, you can't even understand that guy. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it.